welcome back to another episode of the Bulletproof Hygiene Podcast. We're really thankful and grateful to have each person here with us today. Um, we're thankful for all of you who listen on a weekly basis. We're really thankful if you just stumbled upon this podcast and started listening. And our hope is that we can influence how we think about dental hygiene, how we think about the dental profession, how we treat our patients, how we treat each other, and just kind of like help to change the standard in dental hygiene. Um, and today we're talking about caring for our cancer patients. So I think that this is one of those things where as research and science uh, develop, as they always do, we've got to kind of develop with it. So this was a really, really great um, practice in reflection and updating how I think about my cancer patients, how I think about how we treat them and maintain their health and their comfort over a long period of time before, during, and after their cancer treatment experience. Obviously, we've all had loved ones affected by um, different types of cancers, uh, but bearing the responsibility of treating those patients and maintaining their health as much as possible in their, in their new post-cancer treatment life, it, it comes with new challenges and we kind of have to step up to the challenge and make sure that we're using all the tools at our disposal um, to make sure that they are having the best quality of life possible after experiencing radiation, chemotherapy, and possibly surgical interventions for their cancer, whatever type it is. Especially, obviously, as we know, head and neck um, cancer, head and neck radiation can significantly change a person's um, quality of life, their life expectancy. Um, so when researching for this episode, I think Sharice and I would both agree that we found some things that um, will be really, really helpful moving forward. And it was a great overview and reminder of the common side effects that our patients experience, um, you know, during and after their chemo or radiation therapy and how we can most help them. So I'm gonna start with just giving some background about uh, what radiation therapy is and what the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Prosthetics kind of recommends, uh, they kind of gave a really good overview of what radiation entails, what the common side effects are, how this can impact um, a patient's quality of life. And then I'm gonna go into kind of more specifics from the National Cancer Institute a little bit further down about what each of these complications really means and how what recommendations we can make to our patients to help them um, to stay as comfortable and healthy as possible in a long-term way. So, so radiation therapy is used in the treatment or palliation of head and neck cancer patients, as we know. And although this therapy is beneficial, it also has serious side effects, all of which can decrease the patient's quality of life. So patients who have undergone radiation treatment are at an increased risk for xerostomia, for mucositis, which is inflammation of the soft tissues of the mouth, for dental caries, loss of taste, uh, fibrosis of the muscle, vascular and lymphatic tissues, malaise and infection. So one of the most common side effects that I know that all of us have seen at one point in time in our careers with different patients, uh, a side effect of radiation therapy to the head and neck is salivary gland dysfunction. So radiation causes irreversible harm to the cells of the salivary glands, damaging the cells that produce more serous or flowable saliva, which leaves what remains thick, it, you know, it leaves thick and sticky saliva, like as what is left in their mouth, which is very, very uncomfortable and obviously not as cleansing, um, not as neutralizing for the pH as that, that more serous um, saliva. So this often appears during the first week of radiation and is permanent. Um, it's not always permanent, but permanent damage to the salivary glands is seen when the radiation dose exceeds uh, 6,000 centigrades. The total cumulative dose of radiation prescribed for head and neck cancer patients is usually 6,500 centigrades to 7,000 centigrades. The dose of radiation and the amount of the glands in the direct line of the beam determine the degree of permanence of salivary gland dysfunction. So this decrease in salivary output is different for each individual patient and is dependent on his or her initial salivary output and amount of radiation that is delivered during therapy. So for me, I had to look into, okay, what does a centigray um, convert into? So this is just uh, an explanation. A centigray is derived metric measurement unit of absorbed radiation dose of, ion of ionizing radiation. Example is x-rays. So the centigray is equal to one hundredth of a gray 
and the gray is defined as the absorption of one joule of ionizing radiation by one kilogram of matter, e.g. human tissue. So how much ionizing radiation is absorbed by human tissue. Um, normal salivary flow aids in the cleansing of the oral cavity, as we know, by rinsing food and debris from the area. Once the salivary glands have been radiated, there is less saliva flowing from the glands to aid in cleansing of the oral cavity. If a strict daily oral hygiene regimen is not followed, the retention of the food and debris will, will lead to increased tooth decay and oral infection, as we all know. In the oral cavity, saliva also acts as a, as a lubricant. So without saliva, the cheeks, lips, teeth, and tongue will not slide over one another properly for comfort at rest, during speech, and during eating, and movement of food to the stomach. So the structures of the oral cavity will stick to one another, making normal activity difficult. Saliva also initiates the breakdown of foods and specifically carbohydrates via amylase um, for proper digestion and acts as a lubricant. So the, so the food flows down to the stomach without feeling as if it's getting caught in the throat or esophagus. And later, later on, like further down, we'll talk about difficulty swallowing. And this is the, one of the main things that contributes to patients having difficulty swallowing. So loss of taste is also a complication of radiation therapy. The taste buds are very sensitive to radiation and a, and a partial or complete loss of taste will occur during treatment. The sense of taste will recur after treatment is complete, but when and how much taste will be restored is different for each patient. Unfortunately, the taste for sweets may be the first sense to recur. So this may pose serious complications, obviously, for patients who are not taking proper care of their teeth or who are experiencing dry mouth also. Saliva so naturally contains a balance of good and bad entities to maintain oral health. Once this balance is disturbed by radiation therapy, the oral environment changes from good to bad. For instance, the pH decreases to become more acidic and the bacterial balance is shifted to one that helps promote dental decay. So that on top of um, a craving for sweets, because that's the only thing that you can taste, is, is just a recipe for disaster. Um, mucositis is another common and painful side effect of radiation therapy. It's an inflammatory reaction that can occur starting during the first week of radiation therapy and normally subsides shortly after radiation treatments have ended. The severity of mucositis depends on the radiation dose and the amount of tissues in the line of the radiation beam. It may be compared to a very bad coffee or pizza burn to the soft tissues of the oral cavity, making it difficult to eat or speak. So finally, um, radiation therapy will change the cellular makeup of the tissue. So the soft tissues such as skin, muscles, ligaments, uh, will become firm or hard, and they'll become more fibrous. This may be noticed in the inability to open the mouth as wide as before radiation or in the inability to move your head around. In addition, the bone is also affected if a dental extraction is necessary after radiation therapy. There's a possibility that the bone won't heal properly leading to infection. So these are long-term problems that will likely not resolve after radiation therapy is complete. So there are acute and, and chronic issues that result from chemo and radiation. Um, the Really the long-term ones are more likely caused by radiation therapy than chemotherapy. So the National Cancer Institute um, has a lot more detailed information about what I just gave an overview about. So I'm gonna go into some more details. And this is, like I said, it's meant to be kind of an overview and kind of a reminder of what our cancer patients may be dealing with. So that at the end of this, we can say, okay, how can we best help to neutralize, um, to provide palliative measures, to provide preventive care, to keep our patients out of the doctor's chair needing treatment after they've undergone head and neck radiation specifically. Um, so as we know, you know, cancer treatment can cause mouth, mouth and throat problems, especially that head and neck radiation. Uh, some complications of chemotherapy, oral complications caused by chemotherapy, not radiation, include inflammation and ulcers of the mucous membranes in the stomach or intestines, easy bleeding in the mouth and nerve damage. The most common complications uh, may be caused by either chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And these include, you know, the inflamed mucous membranes in the mouth, dry mouth, taste changes, pain, changes in dental growth and development in children, malnutrition as a secondary effect of some of these things and dehydration due to some of these things and difficulty swallowing. So complications may be acute, which are short-term or long-term. So acute complications are ones that occur during the treatment and then obviously go away. Chemotherapy usually causes the acute complications that heal after treatment ends, whereas uh, radiation therapy typically causes the more chronic issues. So chronic complications are the one that continue to appear months or years after treatment, and it might even be indefinitely. Uh, radiation can, can cause acute complications, but may also cause the permanent tissue damage that puts you at lifelong risk of oral complications. 
So the following chronic complications may continue after radiation therapy to the head or neck has ended. So these aren't just acute, these may be chronic issues secondary to radiation. So dry mouth, tooth decay, infections, taste changes, problems in the mouth and jaw caused by loss of tissue and bone, and problems in the mouth and jaw caused by growth of benign tumors in the skin and muscle. So how to manage complications? Obviously, good dental hygiene is going to be imperative for these patients um, before, during, and after care. Um, in maintenance phase, it's important to keep a close watch on uh, oral health during cancer treatment. This helps prevent fine and treat complications as soon as possible. Obviously, the earlier that we can intervene on issues, the less invasive a cancer patient's treatment is going to be. That's going to be ideal. So the National Institutes of Health recommends brushing the teeth and gums with a soft bristle brush two to three times a day for two to three minutes, being sure to brush the area where the teeth meets the gums and to rinse often. So rinsing the toothbrush in hot water every 15 to 30 seconds, that softens the bristle. So this is something specific to our cancer patients. Of course, we're always making the recommendation that a patient brushes their teeth for two to three minutes, two to three times a day. Um, but this is kind of an exception is the running this under hot water. It softens the bristles even for a soft toothbrush. And, and keep in mind that like when your oral mucosa is easily bleeding or easily injured, this is a really, really important thing. So giving our patients that insight is gonna be really important. Use a foam brush only if a soft bristle brush can't be used. Um, let, the, let the toothbrush air dry between brushings. Use a fluoridated tooth, toothpaste with mild taste. So it says that flavoring may irritate the mouth, especially mint flavoring. So we're recommending something other than mint or something with a really neutral flavor. Uh, if toothpaste irritates your mouth, brush with a mixture of a quarter teaspoon of salt added to one cup of water. So rinsing, use a rinse every two hours to decrease soreness in the mouth. Dissolve a quarter teaspoon of salt and a quarter teaspoon of baking soda in one quart of water. An antibacterial rinse may be used two to four times a day for gum disease, rinsing for one to two minutes. And if dry mouth occurs, rinsing may not be enough to clean the teeth after a meal. Brushing and flossing after a meal may be needed as well. So lip care, using lip care products such as cream with lanolin, they specifically recommend to prevent drying and cracking. And then denture care, of course, brush and rinse, your de rinse the dentures every day using a soft bristle toothbrush um, or one made for cleaning dentures. Clean with a denture cleaner recommended by your dentist um, and keep dentures moist when not being worn. Um, oral mucositis. So mucositis and stomatitis are often used in place of each other, but they are different. So oral mucositis is an inflammation of mucous membranes in the mouth. It usually appears the red burn-like sores or as ulcer-like sores in the mouth, whereas stomatitis is an inflammation of mucous membranes and other tissues in the mouth. These include gums, tongue, roof, and floor of mouth, and the inside of the lips and cheeks. And mucositis is one of those side effects that may be caused by either radiation or chemotherapy, and it and it typically will heal by itself, usually within about two to four weeks if there is no infection, if there's no secondary infection. Um, mucositis caused by radiation therapy can last six to eight weeks, depending on how long the treatment was. So if, if there's radiation involved, it's likely to last longer. If it's caused by chemotherapy, it's likely to last for a shorter period of time. And uh, patients receiving high dose, high dose chemotherapy or chemo radiation for stem cell transplant, mucositis usually begins about a week after therapy begins and lasts for about two weeks after treatment ends. So mucositis can cause pain, infection, and bleeding, um, and also trouble breathing and eating. So in regards to pain, there can be a lot of causes for, there can be a lot of reasons for why our cancer patients are experiencing pain in their mouth. And one of them can, can be the cancer itself. It can also be the side effects of all these cancer treatments, obviously. It can be other medical conditions not related to the cancer. And a lot of times they even touch at the end of this article about it being kind of psychological and having to deal with the patient's depression as a result of social inhibitions caused by you know, side effects of cancer treatment, which may affect their appearance, their ability to talk and communicate, their ability to swallow. All of these things impact a patient's experiences, especially in social settings. Um, so because there can be a lot of causes of oral pain, a careful diagnosis is very important. So obviously this includes a, a complete medical history, physical and dental exams, and x-rays of the teeth when indicated, right? Um, so the ways that cancer, the cancer itself can cause pain is the tumor can sometimes press on nearby areas as it grows or affects the nerve, as, as it affects like local nerves and causes inflammation. Leukemias and lymphomas, which spread throughout the body, and may affect sensitive areas of the mouth can cause pain and multiple myeloma can affect the teeth. 
brain tumors can cause headaches. Uh, cancer, cancer may spread to the head and neck from other parts of the body and cause oral pain. And with some cancers, pain may be felt in parts of the body not near the cancer, and this is called referred pain. So tumors of the nose, throat, and lungs can cause referred pain in the mouth or jaw, which I did not know. I had never yeah, heard that before. I hadn't heard that before either. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah. So um, I wonder if it's pain, like, a, I wonder if that's like a trigeminal neuralgia, like nerve intervention kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's gotta be, but also I know referred pain. There's a lot, it's, it's very unique. Like I'd like to learn more about referred pain because I know that there's like psychological and physiological components of that. Right. So what I thought was interesting too, I always love to hear what, um, you know, the complementary and alternative medicine options are for helping to treat these, this sort of thing. So some of the non-drug treatments that the National Institutes of Health, or the, I'm sorry, the National Cancer Institute um, recommends is physical therapy, uh, TENS unit, applying cold and heat, hypnosis. And this one's interesting, acupuncture. I had a patient recently who had uh, tonsillar cancer that was in actually both of his tonsils and his left lymph node told me that he had acupuncture and, you know, immediately following radiation therapy, he had about 5% salivary flow. And then now this is, I think two years since his initial treatment, um, he has about 65% salivary flow. So still not all the way there, but he said that he believes that acupuncture helped him significantly. Of nice. course, we don't know if this is just something that would have kind of come back slowly over time, but he's, you know, reporting anecdotally that that helped him. So that was really interesting. Um, relaxation therapy or imagery, cognitive behavioral therapy, which involves therapy, um, music or drama therapy and counseling. Obviously those can all be helpful things for helping a patient deal with the side effects of their cancer treatment. Um, obviously back different, different types of infections, they can be bacterial, fungal, or viral infections may result just as a, as a side effect of a reduced immune response, right? Or a reduced ability to fight normal pathogens or things that we contact every single day. So for bacterial infections, treatment of bacterial infections in patients who have gum disease and receive high dose chemotherapy may include you know, peroxide mouth rinses, rinses, obviously brushing and flossing and wearing dentures as little as possible, giving their mouth a break. Fungal infections, um, antibiotics and steroids are often used when a patient is receiving chemotherapy and has a low white blood cell count. And these drugs, as we know, change the balance of bacteria in the mouth and in the gastrointestinal tract, which makes it easier for fungal overgrowth to occur, candida to occur. Um, also, fungal infections are common in patients treated with radiation therapy just in general. Patients receiving cancer treatment may be given drugs to help prevent fungal infections from occurring. Candida candidiasis, um, some of the symptoms of candidiasis may include burning pain and taste changes. So it's kind of can be difficult to discern or rule out if the patient's just having those not as a side effect of candidiasis. So always remember to kind of investigate that. Treatment of fungal infections in the lining of the mouth may include treatment, obviously, with mouthwashes and lozenges that contain antifungal drugs. So drugs may be used uh, when rinses and lo lozenges don't get rid of the fungal infections, and they're sometimes used to prevent fungal infections. Regarding viral infections, patients receiving chemotherapy, especially those with immune systems weakened by stem cell transplant, have an increase of viral infection. So herpes virus infections, other viruses that are latent or present in the body but not active and causing symptoms may begin to flare up more than they have in years or decades. So finding and treating the infections early is important. Giving antiviral drugs before treatment starts can lower the risk of viral infections. Uh, bleeding, back to bleeding, um, high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplant can cause lower than normal number of platelets in the blood. Um, so it's a combination of that and, and the change uh, in the actual tissue. Um, bleeding may be mild, starting as small red spots in the lips, uh, soft palate, or bottom of the mouth, or it can be severe, especially at the gum line and from ulcers in the mouth. So areas of gum disease may bleed on their own or when irritated by eating, brushing, or flossing. When platelet counts are very low, blood may ooze from the gums. Um, most patients can safely brush and floss while, while blood counts are low. So treatment for bleeding during chemotherapy might include certain medicines to reduce blood flow and help with clotting, um, topical products that cover and seal bleeding areas, rinsing with a mixture of salt water and 3% hydrogen peroxide. Um, to make the salt water mixture, you put a, a quarter teaspoon of salt in one cup of water. This helps to clean wounds in the mouth and you can rinse carefully so that clots are not disturbed when they are forming. 
So dry mouth, of course, this is a huge issue for us in regards to caries and perio disease and just the patient's comfort, ability, ability to swallow and talk and all of the things. This is a huge issue for our cancer patients. Um, when there's not enough saliva, the mouth gets dry and uncomfortable. And we know that this is called xerostomia. Symptoms of dry mouth can include, you know, thick, stringy saliva, increased feeling of thirst, changes in taste, swallowing or speech, a sore or burning feeling, especially on the tongue, um, cuts or cracks in the lips or at the corners of the mouth, changes in the surface of the tongue, or problems wearing dentures. So dry mouth caused by chemotherapy, uh, the salivary glands often recover two to three months after chemotherapy ends. But like I said, this can be an acute or chronic issue. So caring for dry mouth is much like any of the recommendations that we would make uh, for any of our patients, but making sure that these are the specific like little niche things that we should be recommending for our cancer patients. Obviously flossing every day, brushing with a fluoridated toothpaste, applying fluoride gel at bedtime um, after cleaning the teeth. And Teresa and I will later on talk about how Perrier Protect trays come into that recommendation and how that can be even more effective than just um, making the patient a, a traditional fluoride tray. Obviously avoiding foods and liquids that have a lot of sugar in them, sipping water often to relieve dry mouth soreness. And I have a, a product that I really like for this. Um, my mom has Sjogren's syndrome, so she struggles with dry mouth big time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it can get really uncomfortable. Like you said, like just to even, you know, speak and your tissues are sticking to the teeth and it's, it, it can be really painful. So um, we came across, it's called GC dry mouth gel. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's got a bunch of different flavors and she would just have me order her like a case at a time. And you just put a small little drop in and kind of run it around and it creates that, you know, it's, we found that it lasts a lot longer than something like a biotin. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's something that you, you know, if you haven't checked into that, that's something that we've had some really good success with for our patients with dry mouth. That's good to know. I have not heard of that. I usually recommend, um, hydrus and, um, certain like xylomelts and lozenges and that sort of thing to stimulate yep. salivary flow and provide that uh, xylitol. Yep. Um, so let's talk about changes in taste. So changes in taste is called dysphagia, often uh, a side effect of chemotherapy and radiation care therapy. Changes in the sense of taste is very, very common. It can be caused by damage to the taste buds, it can be caused by dry mouth, it can be caused by infection or other dental problems. Foods may seem not to have taste or just less taste, and radiation may cause a change in sweet, sour, bitter, and salty tastes. Uh, chemotherapy drugs may cause an unpleasant taste in general. In most patients receiving chemotherapy and in some patients receiving radiation therapy, taste returns to normal after a few months after treatment ends. Um, like I said, it can depend on what type of therapy you have and for how long. So fatigue, cancer patients are, who are receiving a really high dose of chemotherapy or radiation therapy often feel fatigue or lack of energy. And this can be because either the cancer itself or its treatment. And obviously this can cause patients to have problems sleeping. It can cause issues with depression. Patients may feel too tired for regular oral care, which may further increase risk for mouth ulcers, infection, and pain. A loss of appetite can lead to malnutrition. So the following can help our patients to get adequate nutrition or to make it easier for them to swallow, to chew, to digest um, their food. So serving food chopped, ground or blended to shorten the amount of time it needs to stay in the mouth before being swallowed. Obviously this reduces the topical exposure to whatever the food is like just in their mouths and decreasing like the, the exposure to carbohydrates and whatever it is that they're eating, but also helps it so that they can digest the food easier once it makes it to their stomach and their digestive tract. Eating between meal snacks to add calories to, to nutrients, eating foods high in calories and protein, and obviously taking supplements to get vitamins, minerals, and more calories. And there is recommendation to uh, meet with a nutritional counselor. Um, and that may help kind of keep a patient's weight up because all of these complications, as we know, can be super cyclical. Like one complication leads to another complication. Malnutrition leads to underweight. Underweight leads to low energy. Low energy leads to, you know, depression and, you know, all these things. So making sure that we are thinking of and considering all these things, it's not our responsibility to treat all these things, but it's our responsibility to know enough to make a recommendation or for a patient to a specialist who can help them with these issues. So when a feeding tube um, is indicated for a patient um, or a liquid diet is indicated, it's important to know that 
Um, normal eating by mouth can sometimes begin again when treatment is finished and the area received that received radiation is healed. So a team that includes a speech and swallowing therapist can help patients with the return to normal eating. So tube feedings are decreased as eating by mouth increases and are stopped when the patient is able to get enough nutrients by mouth. Although most patients will once again be able to eat sal solid foods, many may have lasting complications such as taste changes, dry mouth, and the trouble swallowing. Um, mouth and jaw stiffness. Jaw stiffness can lead to serious health problems, including malnutrition and weight loss from being unable to eat normally, slower healing and recovery from poor nutrition, dental problems from being unable to clean the teeth and gums well and have dental treatments, uh, weakened jaw and muscle from not using them for a long time, emotional problems from avoiding social contact with others because of trouble speaking and eating. So the risk of having jaw stiffness from radiation increases with higher doses of radiation and repeated radiation treatments. The stiffness usually begins around the time that radiation treatment ends. So it may get worse over time, it may stay the same or get better somewhat on its own. Treatment should begin as soon as possible to keep the condition from getting worse or becoming permanent. And treatment for jaw stiffness may include some medical devices for the mouth, um, medicine to relax muscles, jaw exercises, and medicine to treat depression. Obviously, this is something that we are referring out for. And I have a patient who has a real struggle with this. Uh, he had um, head cancer, uh, his upper maxilla on the right side, mm -hmm. and they had to go and take a lot out and then do a lot of radiation. And he has the most limited opening I've ever seen. Um, thankfully we can do bite wings. I kind of just slide the sensor in sideways, which barely fits. Mm -hmm. Um, and he is missing all of his upper right teeth. So that's the only place I can get the sensor in. And then once I get it in there, I'm kind of trying to just turn it by the cord to get it where we need it. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course he does have periodontal disease because he cannot get in there adequately to clean things. Right. So, um, it, this is a really, really big deal. And he has had, he's had one surgery to try and release some of the, um, scar tissue. Mm -hmm. Um, and they feel like they've kind of done what they can do. And then he has to do daily exercises to try and stretch things, but right. the limit, the, the opening is so, so limited. It's, it's, it's almost impossible. Yeah. It's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So swallowing problems, I think is probably one of the biggest problems because it impacts everything else. And, you know, along with all the other cyclical things that we've already listed, this is one of the biggest things. Um, so pneumonia and other respiratory problems, patients who have trouble swallowing may aspirate or inhale food or liquids into the lung when trying to eat or drink. And obviously aspiration can lead to serious conditions, including pneumonia and respiratory failure. Being unable to swallow normally makes it hard to eat well. So malnutrition occurs when the body doesn't get all the nutrients needed for health, which causes slow wound healing and the body is less able to fight off infections. Um, one of the side effects is uh, decreased ability to swallow may increase the risk for needing tube feedings. Um, side effects of pain medication. Sometimes opioids, opioids can be used to treat painful swallowing and may cause dry mouth and constipation. So that's the side effects of trying to fix this issue. Emotional problems, being unable to eat, drink, and speak normally may cause depression and the desire to avoid other people. So this can have significant impacts on how our patient is functioning in their normal life. So uh, difficulty swallowing may be, a, be an effect of damaged blood vessels, of wasting away of tissues in the treated areas, of lymphedema, which is buildup of lymph in the body, overgrowth of fibrous tissue in the head or neck areas, which may lead to jaw stiffness, chronic dry mouth, and infections may all be causes of difficulty swallowing. And swallowing problems have to be managed by a team of experts. So the oncologist often works with other healthcare experts who specialize in treating head and neck cancers and the oral complications of cancer treatment. So these specialists may include a speech therapist, a dietitian, a dentist, and a psychologist. And as we know, you know, radiation therapy can cause um, risk for osteonecrosis of the jaw. And in, in addition to that, it may destroy very small blood vessels within the bone. So this can kill bone tissue and lead to bone fractures and infection. Radiation can also kill tissue in the mouth. So ulcers may form, grow, cause pain, loss of feeling or infection. So this is, you know, anytime medical interventions cause 
such a lengthy list of side effects is a difficult pill for me to swallow. But I think that obviously we know why radiation and chemotherapies are indicated and it has saved many, many people's lives, you know, but with all these um, side effects, we really, really, really have to take quality of life into consideration, you know, and how we can best impact our patients' experiences from here on out and how we can be there for them emotionally and appropriately and who we can refer them to moving forward. So Sharice and I kind of have our own um, thoughts about how to intervene pre, during, and post cancer therapies for our patients. So do you want to go into a little bit of what yours looks like, Sharisa? Yeah. Well, I think first and foremost is, you know, we always start with the medical history with our patients, right? So if you have a new patient that's coming in and they're telling you, oh, I've had cancer in the past, I think it's important to ask a lot of questions and understand what did that look like? Was that just a surgical removal? Was there chemo? Was there radiation? How many of the grays, you know, occurred? These are important things to know because as we're caring for this patient down the road, because sadly, a lot of these um, side effects can be chronic long-term. Mm -hmm. We need to know that, you know, if we have a, a patient who has a cracked tooth and that, you know, tooth needs to be extracted, we need to kind of know the background of what that looks like. So really paying attention and being aware of, especially our new patients have had a previous history. And mm -hmm. maybe that means we communicate with their oncologist to see kind of what treatment looks like. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if we have an active patient with us who develops cancer and, and starts undergoing treatment, again, I think collaboration is everything to be able to really take care of our patients as well as possible. So again, reaching out to the oncologist. Um, with any concerns you have from a dental aspect, anything that you're seeing with, you know, in, infection or, um, you know, decay, perio, all that kind of stuff is important. Um, I know a lot of times I've had a couple of patients who've come in to get dental clearance before, you know, moving forward with chemo and radiation to make sure that things are as stable as possible, but not everybody does that. Um, you know, sometimes people, what they've got going on from a cancer aspect is so imminent and so large that, you know, dental is not a priority at that moment. Right. So I think just really staying in touch with knowing what's happening treatment wise for them is very important. Um, you know, like, like I just said, if it's somebody who's coming in and needing clearance, obviously we need to do all the assessments necessary to make sure that they don't have any fires going on, that there isn't anything that's going to compromise their treatment mid course. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know, obviously at that we're you know, we're assessing for perio. And I think, you know, in our modern day era of uh, everything that we can do for patients, I think salivary testing is really indicated uh, in these scenarios, because we know that specifically the fusobacterium nucleatum and polymorphans gingivalis um, can both block the immune response. So if you've got a patient who's got higher levels of those going on, that's important to know ahead of time because that could actually block their response to the chemo or the radiation or just their immune response in general to healing. So I think it's important to know what we're up against from that aspect. And again, communicate that with their doctor. Mm -hmm. um, right. Treating perio, obviously wanting to get that immune system as stable as possible so it can really focus on what their body needs to do in the healing process. Um, addressing any active carious lesions, um, any TMD issues, you know, we want to get them as comfortable and as healthy as possible before they move forward. Um, I know you and I both are big, big fans of enlisting PerioProtect for a lot of our patients, for a lot of um, compromised situations, but I think cancer is one of those really, really important uh, times to en enroll PerioProtect. Um, and the cool thing is you can use it as a way to not only manage the periodontal pathogens and make sure that we're keeping as healthy of a biofilm as possible, especially in light of dry mouth, mm -hmm. um, but you can also use it as fluoride trays. Right. Um, and not just for what you have super gingivally, but the beauty of the perioprotect is it drives whatever medicament you put in there below all the way to the base of the pocket. So all the way in those, you know, um, root surfaces throughout the mouth. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I like, I, in our practice, we like, um, we have, we carry, uh, the carry free 5,000 gel with xylitol. Mm -hmm. And I like that when it's a clear gel, so there's no staining issues with it. Um, it's, you know, a little more viscous, so it's easy to kind of just brush into the tray and, and pop in and they can sleep 
with it in, you know, at night, if they're comfortable doing that or wear it, you know, obviously for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour a day. Now I will say there can be a complication with the perio trays for patients who have extremely dry mouth because it's not comfortable in there. So that's where you may want to enlist something like the GC dry mouth gel. Mm-hmm. Um, um, there's another product I'm going to encourage our listeners to look up and, and check out. And Brittany and I are going to have um, more on this uh, in the coming weeks, but there's a new company out called Stella Life. Um, they all also have some, um, some gels that are amazing and they're all natural products. And those kind of things might need to go hand in hand with wearing the perio trays, mm-hmm. kind of just put a drop in there, swirl it all around, get things feeling smooth and silky, and then put the perio trays in so that they're not sticking to anything. Right. What do yeah. you like to, what do you recommend for your patients on the dry mouth front? I mean, the things that you just recommended and in addition, I like, <clears throat> so I was recommending biotine for a long time and my patients were like, okay, that's very like acute relief. You know, it didn't last. It doesn't last very long. Like you rinse with it and, and then it's like, okay, you have like 10 minutes of relief right. kind of thing. Um, I've been recommending Colgate Hydrus mouth rinse because the effect I've just heard from my patients, it's better in their experience than biotene. So I've been recommending that that's over the counter. I like xylomelts to stimulate um, salivary flow and to give them that topical exposure to some xylitol and bring down the um, bacteria load. Sorry, I have a cold today. I apologize for my slowness and hesitation. I'm like, my brain is working at half speed here. (laughs) Um, And then I really like just in general for, for most of my patients across the board, the sonic fusion toothbrush. And that may be something that is too, um, too vigorous for a patient to use while they're undergoing radiation or chemotherapy, like, um, with the, the mucositis, or if they're having a bleeding issue or a clotting issue, I think that this may be too much. I think that they should probably do just a soft toothbrush that they run under that hot water every 15 seconds or so. Um, but after initial treatment is complete, Sonic Fusion 2.0, I've just found anecdotally when my patients are using that versus just a sonic air toothbrush or versus just an oral B or just an electric toothbrush and flossing, um, that in addition to flossing is very, very effective for plaque removal. I have found like plaque scores way, way lower and perio more controls for my patients who are like, just won't do the perio protect, um, with the sonic fusion 2.0 toothbrush. And it's something that they can find on Amazon or really anywhere. It's pretty, um, widely available now. Yeah. And for patients, for patients who may not want to make that investment yet, um, you know, at least a water pick. Mm-hmm. is a great idea. Um, like you said, if they're in, if they've got a lot of mucositis going on and they're, and that's just not comfortable or the tissues are just really tender, um, you know, using a water pick on a really low setting is a good idea. Mm-hmm. And also just good old fashioned, you know, that you, you talked about several times that one of the things they recommend is, you know, salt water as a rent, but you could, if you're also like really in the middle of treatment and things it's, you're just having a rough time. Um, even just dipping some gauze into a saltwater rinse and kind of wiping the teeth down and wiping the gums down yeah. can be, can be a good option in the, in the height of, you know, the discomfort. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then, you know, making sure that the patient is, you know, on three month recare or whatever frequency is going to work best for them. I think minimally three month recare. Um, if there's a lot of calculus or plaque accumulation and the person is having trouble with their home care, obviously, you know, increase the, the recare frequency. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think on that front too, um, if you have a patient who was kind of a high risk decay patient before any of this, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, maybe updating their bite wings twice a year instead of once just to, you know, be sure that we're catching everything and, and keeping things, you know, as, early and incipient as possible so that, you know, we're not dealing with bombed out teeth or, you know, root canals or things like that. Right. And what I, what I realized too, this is kind of like an afterthought, but what I realized about cancer patients sometimes is that they're not super, super forthcoming with their current cancer status too. Like if their cancer comes back or they don't get a good, you know, PET scan or whatever it is, if their, if their cancer status um, changes from uh, remission, you know, to, active or something, you know, if it changes, right. Sometimes I feel like it's a very emotional topic for them and they don't want to discuss that very openly at the dentist, unless it's really like, I make it known like, Hey, this is really important information. It's because I care about you. I want to make sure that we're treating you adequately. Like it wouldn't be my business if that weren't the case kind of thing. Right. But making sure that we're always up to date with whatever their current um, cancer status is and communicating with their oncologist when necessary. 
um, and getting clearance before any invasive procedures, obviously anytime they've had head and neck radiation. So right. if a person is about to lose a tooth, obviously that's uh, an instance when the doctor would communicate with the oncologist and maybe get a history of radiation, um, have the patient understand what their risks are regarding the procedure, even if scaling and root planing is indicated, you know, just making sure that we're always communicating with the person's specialists. And before treatment, whenever there is that opportunity to do something, put out the fires and implement prevention strategies for a patient before they start treatment, when, when it isn't that aggressive scenario where, that you described where the patient may not have the opportunity to do this, anytime we can put out fires and give the patient all the tools that they could possibly need to be as comfortable and successful long-term and meeting us as little as possible, that we can do, we want to do. So that's perio protect from the get-go. That's doing the scaling and root plan. That's doing any perio surgery. That's doing any extractions. That's doing any, you know, are we going to make you a partial denture? How are we going to help you with getting adequate nutrition with recovery once the radiation and chemotherapy is done? Like doing as much of that as possible on the front end and setting them up for success and kind of helping them to emotionally and mentally and physically prepare for life after cancer therapy. Yes. And I think the one prevailing thing just needs to be empathy. I mean, as you're going through reading what this can look like for somebody, I mean, it is, like you said, it's, it's obviously in cases, it's a necessary thing right. um, to preserve life, but man, the, the side effects are really, really detrimental and hard for patients. Yeah. And so I think just meeting them with the empathy, because again, us giving, you know, patients bad news on top of their already, you know, bad situation. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's a hard place. And I, I see why depression is so common for these patients. Cause you just feel like, Oh my gosh, I can't win here. It's just thing after thing after thing. So I think just being empathetic with them and, you know, reminding them that we're here with them and we obviously don't want to make things harder on them. Right. Um, we want to help them win and be like you said, as comfortable as possible. Yep. So we love our cancer patients. We hope that this yes. was a helpful episode for everyone. Um, we hope that it helps everyone to gain some empathy and insight. And it's a helpful reminder as to what they might be going through. And if you have any questions or you have any recommendations about how you um, treat your cancer patients, please post on our Mighty Network. It's, uh, it's an app you can download. It's free to join the network. Um, so it's Mighty Networks and then search Bulletproof Hygiene. And we would love to hear about any recommendations that you have for us. Yes. Thanks, absolutely. thanks again. As always, thank you so much for listening. Thanks so much for joining us today and we will talk to you soon. Have a great week, everybody.